into this thing, you guys might have heard of it. Like, if you're ever in a situation where you can't be there in person, right? There's a thing called Zoom. And through the magic of Zoom, Ollie, who sadly tested positive for COVID this week, but he's actually doing okay, is joining us today. Now, Ollie is a health coach and nutrition therapist for stressed out folk. He's known for sending people to sleep in 25 different countries for over 16 years. <laughs> and in the coolest of cool speaker walk on tracks, he's actually going to appear to his own music that is on Spotify. <laughs> Hello, and uh, yeah, i am got serious FOMO right now, but uh, we're all here together. How are you all doing? Yeah. Yay. Good. Obviously, I've not missed out on much being sitting at home watching TV for a couple of days. And so we have the talk here today. Um, just first off, you can all see the screen as well, right? Yeah. 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 Just, just one cool. thing to ask, if you can save questions till the end, because we might just have to do a bit of mic stuff, but stay close to the end, please. Yeah, um, I can just see a little picture of you guys, but can't really see if anyone puts their hands up or anything. All right, apologies for the uh, the bunged up nose. Um, as Noel said, I tested positive Friday morning. Like, it's had two years to get COVID, and I get it <laughs> literally in the morning before the event. But anyway, we're talking about sleeping your way to increase productivity and health, or um, as we decided in our whole life mastermind with, with Shona, Hang on, I've got to change the slide. Uh, sleep on your way to the top. Um, and uh, we, we shall go through <laughs> some, some different things with regard to health and how we can look to improve our sleep and a couple of other things to make us more productive and to truly actually, I hate saying the best version of you, but to become the best version of you, I'm not gonna say it anymore in this talk. <laughs> First off, um, for you guys that don't actually know who I am. I've been putting some content in the DC and um, been going to the Juntos and stuff, but um, I am Ollie Matthews and I'm a nutrition therapist, functional medicine, healthcare provider and personal trainer have been um, working with people, as Noel said, for like 16 years. Um, well, yeah, coming up to 16 years in 25 different countries so far. Um, working on getting people really, really healthy, getting them to look really good, but I went from being an overweight DJ producer rapper, which I came out of retirement last year, as you would have heard if I didn't actually come on so quickly, um, and then became a competitive bodybuilder. But that was not the healthy person that I envisaged I was going to be. What happened when I lost like 100 pounds to get on stage was that I actually became more insecure. It was a shell of muscle, but I had to do a lot of work internally and on, on my mindset before I actually became truly the healthy person that I was going to say I feel I am today. I feel good, but that I was a few days ago. And there's a picture of me as an overweight DJ looking dead by, by the looks of that. But I've written a couple of books and I used to work with professional athletes, um, someone from the Tour de France in 2016, Ultraman world champion. And I worked with a company where we had a method called hybrid training, where we would actually get people to be ridiculously jacked. Um, so look really good and be able to do like half marathons, marathons, and be really good with endurance as well. But the true story of why I do what I do um, is that when I was 15, um, my dad actually passed away. He was 47 years old and he was a guy who was actually, he was my role model and he was just stressed out as an individual. He used to work at caravan parks, was a sales manager and then got headhunted to turn parks around where they're basically from underperforming to doing really, really well, but he was stressed out and he used to have migraines all the time wake during the night and all these different things. And he went into a course on the Monday and he got hit around the head. He was playing volleyball as uh, just the team building event. And he got a migraine. And the next day he went into hospital with this migraine. And on the Wednesday, they said, he's going to be absolutely fine. And then he had a stroke. And on the Saturday night, we had to turn off his life support machine. And I didn't realize how much that would really 
kind of pushed me down this journey of health until a few years later. And I was working with these athletes and I had a couple of guys that entrepreneurs that really wanted to push themselves performance wise when it's like doing runs, doing half marathons, um, doing some powerlifting meets, doing some photo shoots. And that was all great. But then one day this guy rang me up. His name was Rick Barker. And he said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I need you to tell me what I know what to do. I need you to tell me to do it. And I was just thinking like, why is this guy ringing me? I Googled him and thought, it's Taylor Swift manager. And it was Taylor Swift manager when, when Kanye jumped on the stage in 2008, I want to say, uh, who launched her career. And three months later, he signed up straight away. Three months later, I was in his house in Nashville. And it was all good working with these athletes, getting them from A to B as fast as possible. But in truth, it was not really looking at health. It was just speed because that's what paid their bills. And Rick said to me that I want you to give me back, give my wife back what she married 10 years ago. We're standing there in his kitchen in Nashville, totally snowed in January, like 2018. And his 13 year old son was there. His 15 year old daughter was there. And he said, look, Ollie, you've just given Jill back what she married 10 years ago. And I'm just like, it's like goosebumps was here. I just realized there and then that everything clicked that I couldn't help my dad, but I could help these stressed out entrepreneurs, business owners, whatever we want to call ourselves. I could help these guys to really lower stress and truly become healthy. So I just dived into everything from then. And over, like you've probably seen quite a few of the posts that I put out in, in the forum um, about the methods that I use, but there are many signs that we can look at that to see that health is impacting your productivity and essentially is, is leaving money on the table. And the first one, and probably one of the biggest things that I notice when people are having problems with their health is that they are not sleeping through the night. So people are waking up to go to the toilet and something that is a recurring theme through this is that just because something is common doesn't make it normal. So, so many people wake up, like even just once and we say, oh, it's because I drunk loads of water or um, I, I drunk before bed or whatever it is. And it's not, your body is showing signs of stress if you're waking up. If you didn't drink that water, would you still wake up? If your kids didn't wake you up, would you still wake up? And usually the answer is yes. Or we wake up really early and totally wired. Like you wake at like 4 a.m. And then people say it's our most productive time. Yes, if the family isn't up, maybe that is the case. But usually it's a sign that we are really, really stressed out and the body isn't performing as it could be. And then we get energy dips throughout the day as a result of that. Or we literally walk into a room and then we think, why the fuck did we just walk in here? And we forget where our phone is, we forget where our keys are and all that sort of thing. Um, if we're trying to drop weight, we struggle with dropping weight or regularly getting cold and feeling run down or you get brain fog, you get migraines, you get fatigue. And one of the other most common things that I see is people get random bloat and cold hands and feet, not just because of the weather, but we get cold hands and feet. And if we think about actually where our hands and feet are at the extremities of our body, we end up finding that the blood struggles to get there. So the heart can't pump it. And we've got gravity working with this on our hands and feet. If we can't get blood to our hands and feet, it's gonna to struggle to get fully oxygenated blood to our brain as well. So it's definitely something which is a sign that we could be more productive and more healthy. And and more healthy, that wasn't good English, and healthier, sorry, Shona. Um, <laughs> what three things are gonna help you improve your productivity and health? Well, um, I got asked the other day about, yes, you're a personal trainer, but what makes you different with these side of things? And um, it made me really truly think about the three main things we work on before we really dive into the training side of things or optimization, shall we say, is that Sleep is the first one. So sleeping your way to success, learning how to sleep through the night, learning to love sugar and having it at the right time. So managing your blood glucose levels and simply stop getting bloated. And they're the three things that we're gonna go through today.
um, briefly. Obviously, I know we haven't got loads and loads of time, and I'm known to run on with this stuff. So, no, give me a like virtual nudge if I need to hurry up. Um, so the first one going through is improving your sleep. And once we see all these different things, they are massively linked. But we can see how improving each one will truly sit, let us see how to improve our productivity by improving our health. So with your sleep, just having an optimal routine. Now, what is an optimal routine? The body does like, it works by this body clock, our circadian rhythm, which I'm sure you guys have heard of, but we wake up and we go to sleep based on the rise and fall of the sun. And so many of our days are kind of dictated, especially when we go into different time zones and we're up later, we're up earlier, all these different things going on. But if we can have a consistent wake up time, and a consistent sleep time as much as possible. So like 80% of the time we get to bed at the same time or we wake up at the same time. Yes, there are gonna be days that we don't follow this. Like I probably go to sleep and wake at the same time about 90% of the time. Hence why when I've been at Junto's, I've then got the train home at like nine o'clock and been like the first one there, first to leave as well. So that is one thing we can look at. What are we doing in the morning? Are we using our phone just before bed? Have we got exposure to blue light or green light? And is that impact in our sleep? How is our room temperature and all these different things? Then we get into managing our nutrition and blood glucose levels, which will be in the next, the next stage of the, of the talk. And here we have balanced heart rate variability. Now, one of the markers I look at uh, for health. And if you've got anything like an aura ring, a Fitbit, Apple watch, whoop band, whatever the technology is that you can use, managing your heart rate variability is a surefire sign to see how, how much stress your body is actually under. So we want this to be at 60 or above most days, like as much as we can. And what this actually is, is that when our heart beats, so we have this, what we would say, like a, we think it beats at the same time each each time, boom, 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 boom. But there are certain variations between these beats and every time the heart pumps. And the more varied they are, the less stress we're in. The more we're in our stress state, in a fight or flight mode, the less variation there is. And I've seen people that have been at like 10s and 15s on the HRV, and you get up 10, like saying we need to get it to 60 can be quite overwhelming if they're down here. If we get it up 10, you feel a different person. And then that 20 becomes normal. Then you get it up to 30 and we work on this over time. And it's one of the biggest things that is gonna help you improve your sleep, but not just that, but manage stress overall. And your environment as well, like having a dark room, having the right temperature in your room, not being too hot. Um, trying not to get your partner to kick you through the night, which I've not, if anyone's got any ideas how to stop that, then please <laughs> let me know. Um, exercise timing is another thing. So many people I've seen that have struggled with sleep, but then we go and put exercise in, in the evening. Now exercise is going to boost your cortisol levels. Uh, it's going to increase your blood glucose levels. And we need to kind of look at the stress levels of that exercise when we put it in there. And is it going to help us or is it going to hinder us? And I know that our schedules are all different and we have to work out what we do to actually get the right levels of movement in there. But it's absolutely something that we would look at. Uh, and then lastly comes your, your caffeine intake. Now, I love coffee as much as the next person, but if we are having to wake up with coffee, that can massively impact our sleep. Um, it activates the bowel, uh, hence the coffee makes me poop side of things. And we want to let the body wake up naturally as such. So giving it a couple of hours until you have coffee, if you've had problems with your sleep, is going to help you. And the same with having coffee later in the day. It has a half-life of like five, six hours. And um, ladies, if you're on any um, contraceptive pills, depending on the pill, it could actually be a doubled half-life. So what that means is that if you have a cup of uh, an Americano, basically you have half an Americano still in your system five, six hours later. So it's, it's definitely something to look at when you're having caffeine. And if you do love coffee, even decaf has about 50% of caffeine in it. So you still want to, or is about 50% caffeine. So you still want to look at when you're having that decaf as well. 
So improving your sleep, optimize your routine, get good nutrition. So good whole foods, manage your blood glucose levels, balance your heart rate variability, optimize your environment, your exercise timing and your caffeine intake. Then we go on to managing blood glucose. And one of the things I look at when people test their blood glucose, now you could have a constant glucose meter, something like a Freestyle Libra, um, depending on where you are here in the UK, you can buy them without a prescription. But if you're in the US and some other countries, you might have to get a prescription for them, um, but you can get them sent through and you put a meter on your arm for like two weeks and that will tell you where your glucose levels are. And basically you want them, if you're in the UK EU readings as well, 4.2 to 4.9. If you're in the US, then it's between 80 and 90 milligrams or millimoles per deciliter. And what this is, is glucose, when it's high, it's actually a toxic substance in the blood. And we need to get it to sites where it can do its job rather than cause inflammation. Because every time we, we feel hangry, like we get low blood glucose, it's a sign that the body is potentially going to cause more inflammation as a result of this. So how do we do that? Well, again, good nutrition. And it's quite vague just saying good nutrition because every single person is different. The way I would look to work with someone is we have a rough guideline of where we're going to go with nutrition. How do you work with um, good levels of protein and good levels of fat? Where do we put your carbohydrates? But actually looking at when your glucose levels are potentially low or they're potentially high, what are we having around them? So if you want to test the glucose meter or you want to get a finger prick where it's um, a glucometer, test like 20 minutes before a meal, 20 minutes after and two hours after that, because that will allow you to see this is where it was, this is where it's gone to, and this is where, has it gone back down to where it was before the meal? And you can change your nutrition composition as a result of that. Another way to help manage uh, blood glucose is being consistent. Again, like I said, with your sleep times, be consistent with your meal timings because your body will start releasing enzymes to help um, with digestion of food and it will start releasing insulin to get that glucose into the cells where it does its job. And another thing that happens, which I didn't mention on sleeping through the night when we look at blood glucose is that your brain primarily fuels off of glucose. And yes, we can go through different things like ketosis, if the body isn't under a high level of stress, if we become adapted, but your brain primarily functions off of glucose. Now, if we're going through the night, if we imagine your brain is something like Heathrow Airport, during the day, there's flights coming and going left, right, and center. Now, during the night, there's still admin, there's still restocking things, there's still maintenance going on and cleaning and all these different things. That is exactly what's going on in your brain. So it uses a lot of fuel during the night. Now, if we have our glucose levels, our glucose management quite poor because of poor nutrition and poor meal timing and high levels of stress, that glucose levels, they end up dropping. And as a result, what happens is that our body releases cortisol because one of cortisol's prime functions is to boost blood glucose levels because our brain needs it to function. Therefore, it does this in the morning to wake us up, but it also does it when we go low on glucose, hence why people awaken during the night. So also managing blood glucose levels is we have a good adrenal function. We have to have good levels of cortisol, high in the morning, lower in the evening, um, and working on our body. If you can hear my dogs in the background, they've just started howling. So apologies for that. We're live. Um, a good circadian rhythm. So good body clock. All these things help us manage blood glucose levels. And the last one, when it comes to exercise, um, given my history of competing in bodybuilding, honestly, when I was competing in bodybuilding, I'd done seven shows over a period of six years. So one year on, one year to improve and so on. So I'd done three years of competing over the, over the course of six years. And now over the course of five years, I can't count. But when I was training like that and if you think the stress level that gets high, you get to really extreme low levels of body fat. One of the things that happened was that my sleep was ridiculously messed up. My blood glucose levels were all over the show. If I didn't eat every three hours, then there would be a problem. I would get massively hangry and it would be a massive, massive issue. And it's something that I would definitely look at with people that 
yes, we go into training with people, but less of the beast mode. Like if your body is already stressed and trust me in the past, like I've used exercise as my coping mechanism and it's not a good place to be in because if you're stressed and you fight fire with fire, we just get more stressed. The body doesn't see exercise as a different stress, as relationship stress, as environmental stress, as work stress. It just sees stress. So we have to get this balance completely right. And if we don't, then we have more problems with, with sleep and we have more problems with blood glucose management. And as a result, we then have problems with gut health as well. So it is an overall balance of how much can I push myself, but still recover, still have good heart rate variability. Am I still sleeping through the night? And you can see all these markers as to see what is truly going on with your body. So nutrition, right? Good meal timing. Another thing with meal timing um, is that a lot of people push intermittent fasting. And whilst that could be absolutely awesome, I do intermittent fasting. I do a 10 hour window most days, um, or nine to 10 hour window. And if you've got poor blood glucose management though, one of the worst things you can do at first is to jump straight into a smaller window. So work your way up to it, manage your blood glucose better so that you can then end up having your nutrition as you want it. But the key thing is consistency throughout. Then we come on to working on your gut. And one of the key things that we have to look at with your gut, many people go to probiotics or um, digestive enzymes, all these different things. But if you're suffering random blow, it can be massively frustrating. Is it a food? Is it stress? What actually is it? And we have to find out what is actually blo bloating you. When I work with people, we, we look at the body from a north to south, from a top down process. And by the time we get to our stomach, like, there's a lot more things that could go on. Now there's a phase in um, digestion, uh, in, in eating called mastication. You've got to make sure you get that right. Mastication, when we think of like Homer Simpson, when he has a donut, then he's drooling. It's like, oh, a donut. That's basically when we get the saliva producing, we start chewing our food. And then from there, we end up activating, and there's enzymes in, in the saliva, we activate a nerve on the back of our throat called the vagus nerve, which connects our brain to our gut and other organs and sends signals to the gut and from the gut. So we have to have good vagal tone. We have to have good connection there. If we don't, then it doesn't send the signals down to our gut to produce the enzymes. If someone, one of the questions I ask all my clients when we start is, have you ever been knocked out? And if someone has been knocked out or been through severe trauma, severe stress, or they've been through PTSD, it's gonna have different ramifications as to someone that hasn't. And we might have to be a little bit stricter with that person. And this isn't about brain health as such, but we definitely have to look into the neurological side of things of what is actually bloating us. Uh, the bloating may be a symptom, but it's not where we would find the cause. The cause could be in signaling before that point. And one of the things we have, and um, it's looking at our gut health, where are we getting enough diversity into our gut? We talk about fiber and people say, you need to get this like 30, 30, whatever the magic number is nowadays, 35 grams of fiber into our gut, which is all great. But if we look at look how I used to be with competing in bodybuilding, it would be like broccoli or green beans. There wouldn't be very much diversity in the fibers. So what I do with a lot of clients, once we can handle this, is that we, we get veggie sludge, need to find a much more marketable name for it, but veggie sludge, where we get like 20 different vegetables, blitz them all up, and then put them in the freezer in ice cube trays. And every time we have a protein shake or have um, soup or something, you can just get it out and you can blitz it. And that meal then has a lot of different strains of fiber and bacteria and different things that are going to help your gut microbiome and it's definitely something which we can all look to improve on so we think about the actual i look at the veg that i have on a week-to-week -week basis and there's probably even trying there's probably 12 maybe 13 different items of veg so go and get veg that you wouldn't normally have have that in your diet and consume it and as we said like your gut is directly connected to your brain so we've got that vagal tone how can we improve that vagus nerve and, and the tone there 
singing might not be good for the people around you, but singing loud can actually stimulate the, the vagus nerve and work on that vagal tone. Gargling is massively, massively beneficial. Um, again, it's remembering to do it. And if we think about gargling and you think about going to the gym to work a muscle, you don't just do one bicep curl and your, your arms grow, you have to work on these things. Working on your gag reflex and whilst I don't recommend it at first, uh, you can have like a coffee enema, um, enema, sorry, which is not really, you don't really want to stick coffee up your bum if you can help it. Much better in the mouth. Um, and then we have to remember that the gut works on a body clock as well. As we said, that if, if you've been on an early flight and you've got yourself up, say you wake up, if I go to a flight from Heathrow, I'm here in Norwich and it's like three, three and a half hours to drive down to Heathrow. And if I'm normally having my first meal around sort of half 10, 11, if I've woke up three, four hours earlier, it's going to be hard to then force myself to eat on that body clock. Uh, on that time, like four hours after I wake up. And it's something that you'll notice that when you travel, the gut maybe takes a day or two to kick back into play. Um, working on your stress levels is one of the biggest things, uh, which again, is easier said than done, but awareness of what is stressing you. Is it physical? Is it environmental? Is it mold exposure or something like that that is coming from your environment? We've had that with clients before where we've had to do mold tests and simply taking them out of their environment just for a little bit has helped their body whilst they improve the mold exposure at home. And also like looking at relationship stress and so many different things goes into managing our stress levels. And I think also the pressure we have on ourselves is massively a massive cause for gut problems as well. And lastly, my mom isn't going to see this, but chew your food because how many times that I've seen, I've, I've had, uh, I was over in Budapest with a client a couple of years ago and he was like, Ali, I, I feel hungry after I've eaten. I'm like, how do you feel hungry? You had so much veg and salad and stuff there. There was meat and everything. And I realized that he was sitting there at the table, scrolling through Facebook and not really chewing his food. So we put his phone into another room. He was sitting at the table, consciously eating, chewing his food. Now we should chew around sort of, 10 to 20 times, depending on the person. One of the biggest markers or one of the most clearest markers that we can improve health, if you're one of the people that is always last to finish and you have to chew your food because you don't produce enough saliva, then that is a massive marker that the connection between the brain and the gut and other things going on there is something we need to improve on. So chewing your food, if you have to excessively chew like 40, 50 times, then we need to look at that. But 10 to 20 times, chew your food. It helps activate um, the vagus nerve and goes down from there. So working on your gut, what is bloating you? Are you getting enough diversity? The gut is connected to your brain. So make sure we're working on stress management and you've got a good body clock working there, your circadian rhythm where we go to sleeping and waking at the same time and making sure you chew your food. Now. The biggest secrets that we have to look at, and don't worry, this isn't coming into a pitch or anything like that. The biggest secrets is that the basic stuff is what we need to do. Like so many people look at all like the biohacking side of things, getting all the nootropics in, getting all these different things, which yes, they can have a bit of a positive impact, but it's all good doing them. If we're not hydrating ourselves, if we're not being consistent with when we go to sleep, if we're not actually focusing on getting good sleep, if we're not actually getting a good foundation of nutrition in place, then that stuff is not going to have as good an impact as we want it to. But it's great to chuck on social media. It's awesome to say that sort of thing. And it gives us a dopamine release, but eventually we need more and more dopamine as a release. And that can be a, a, a negative as such. So do the basic stuff before you do the sexy stuff. And it's not just about chucking in supplements or cutting things out, being overly restrictive. We have to work on those foundations on making sure the nutrients are right in there and making sure it's built as more for an individual. So I could tell you all exactly what I do with my diet, but that's Ollie Matthews's diet. It's not going to be 
Noel's diet. It's not going to be shown as diet. It's not. It's it's about finding as an individual what is the basic stuff that you can do right now. And then lastly, it's consistency over perfection, especially right now. If we look at December, a lot of times, like ironically, I'm saying this, we're being sick. Cons like people get sick in December. It's the holiday season. We we potentially take our eye off the ball when it comes to our schedule, when it comes to our sleep, more alcohol, more processed food. And people say, oh, I always get like sick over Christmas, but it's obvious as to see why. What can you do right now to help you improve? Just look at consistency. Stop trying to be perfect when it comes to health. If you can't do 100%, do 90. If you can't do 90, do 80. If you can't do 80 and so on until you get like, just do a little bit that you can commit to every single day. And these are things which I would recommend absolutely to do right now. Just write down your own perfect routine for each day. How does your perfect routine look and how can you get closer to that right now? Create a nutrition strategy with something that you know you will do. If you like steak, don't go vegan. If you like carbohydrates, don't go keto. Find out what is going to work with you and how your body actually is and work out what you're actually going to be able to do movement wise. Don't commit to five gym sessions a week if three sessions is where your schedule is at. If your HRV is not 60 and above, then that's something which we you, you want to look at. How much can I push to actually get my HRV up? Because we may need to move to do that and still improve. Then we look at just putting it somewhere visible and tell people and lastly work on your gut microbiome. So I'm not sure what the, the timing is there, um, but that's my talk. I'm here to answer any questions that you guys may have. Ollie, if you uh, stop sharing your screen and then you'll probably be able to see us a little bit. There we go. Yeah, we've got time for a couple of questions. Oh, Martin. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is H, uh, HRV, like of 60. Are you talking about like sleep uh, at sleep time or? As in, so if you, if you have things like an Apple watch will track your HRV, your heart rate variability throughout the day. Um, the aura ring will do an average of what your heart rate variability is during the night. And I think your Fitbit you have to sleep for over four hours for it to track. If anyone's got a Fitbit and can confirm that, you have to sleep for over four hours for it to track. Um, the question and is, my aura is like showing me like 20 to 30, but if I use a different device, it shows my uh, heart rate variability to 60 or 70. So the devices are very, very different. <laughs> And like, I'm not sure what's true actually. What is your best? So I've, I've, I've got the watch and the aura. Mm -hmm. So in the aura, if you go on readiness and then you click on HRV or heart rate variability, which is in the four, like the grid at the top half of the page, I find that the aura ring is more about, more closer to how I actually feel than, than my Apple watch. So I don't know, like, it's about finding which one is going to be not like gives you the number that you want, but that like, we all have our own way of like, yeah, I feel like crap today. Oh, but my HIV says 80, but like, we know that it's not really going to be the most accurate. So have a look over time. I personally find my aura ring is much more accurate than if I've used, there's an app on your phone called Weltery, um, which even just the free one I've scanned on that for like weeks on end. I've used my uh, Apple Watch. And when you actually do the Apple Watch, if you go into the health app, it will give you an HRV. Like if you go on health app, browse, and then heart and heart rate variability, it gives you the day average, but you want to kind of look at your week and month to see what the average of the day before is. Um, and there's a lot more variables I find in the Apple Watch one. Um, for comparison, I, I think the, the Aura one, personally, I think is uh, much more accurate. Uh, and this is the last Aura ring, not the not the one that's just been released. If you're talking of 60, you're talking about like an Aura score at night. You're getting like a 60 at night at Aura? No, uh, heart rate variability with Aura. So at the moment, my readiness says 88, but my HRV is 55. 
So it's been quite low this week. Um, like I can actually tell pretty much from my HRV when the symptoms started, which is a good thing to look at that. But I would say, I don't know if you guys can actually see. Uh, yeah. So it's the HRV up here. That's, that's where like it gives you a readiness and that's based on so many different factors. I usually just see what people's HIV actually is. Does that make sense? Yeah, time for one more. Max? Buddy, um, two, two part question um, and great talk, by the way. Uh, firstly, I, I wanted to get an aura ring for a while, but my, my main exercise is combat sports and that's so I've convinced myself that won't work. I won't be able to track exercise. Um, what do you recommend? And second part of the question, are you Norwich or United? Because I can't tell from your, your <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm United um, and I'm Norwich unless they're playing United. So next week I have got tickets in the away stands. So, um, but yeah, so just got put off with it. Combat sports were questions. Um, uh, tracking, tracking exercise or combat sports, sorry. So, I don't use my ring when I weight train um, and I've got my Apple watch, which I can track with that stuff. But I think the power in the aura ring is from tracking around everything else. So as long as you're not always tracking your combat stuff, I mean, you could use a whoop band, but again, like if you're doing grappling and stuff, you're going to be hitting each other's wrists and, and grabbing each other's wrists. So even a whoop band or Fitbit or whatever it is, isn't going to be um, very useful for that. But uh, you could have a heart rate, a band around your chest, the chest band, um, which are very accurate um, as well. But I think it's about consistency with tracking elsewhere. So wearing your ring until you get to the gym to, um, to do your, your, your grappling and putting it back on afterwards. And the consistency to see like you're still going to have tracking. The HRV is done overnight as well on the aura ring. Um, and until the new one, so I haven't even looked too much in depth in the new one because everything I need is in the, the the previous one. But I believe the new one does have live exercise tracking. However, um, I wouldn't stress too much about tracking the exercise. I would track before and after and have consistency there. Cool, nice one. That's all we've got time for, guys. But Ollie will be very happy to take questions direct. So thank you very much. Cheers, yeah. Ollie. Okay.